Hello and welcome. My name is Kate Pierce and I am the publisher at Phoenix Publishing House, an independent specialist in mental health publishing. This webcast is a follow up to our hugely successful webinar, Dissociative Identity Disorder, The Hidden Condition, held on the 30th of June 2021. We were bowled over by the number of people who registered for the event and who joined us on the night. Um, the level of interest was quite unprecedented and it showed us the demand out there worldwide to learn more about dissociative identity disorder, also known as DID, and the lack of information, resources, and support that currently exists, not only for those living with DID, but also for professionals who may work with them. An astonishing number of questions were asked throughout the event, over 200 in total, and understandably, we were unable to get to them all on the night. Going through the unanswered questions, a number of specific themes became apparent, and this webcast is the opportunity to look at and discuss these wide ranging outstanding issues. Coupled with the original webinar, we hope to provide a helpful resource for those interested in learning more about DID. The webinar is also available on our YouTube channel, and I would highly recommend watching it before this webcast if you haven't already. We are joined tonight by three of the original panelists, Jill Frost, Phoenix author, whose book, The Girls Within, A True Story of Triumph Over Trauma and Abuse, was the catalyst for the event. A link to the book is given in the description to the webcast. Amanda Ball, who brought the much needed perspective of someone who lives with DID. And Alf McFarland, who supervised Jill throughout her treatment of The Girls Within. And it's to Alf who I shall shortly hand you over. Before I do, I want to thank you for watching and hope that you enjoy this webinar and find it of use. Over to you, Alf. Thanks, Kate, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Alf. I'm a Jungian psychotherapist uh, working in private practice in Leicester in England. And my role in this event is mainly to be the question master. Uh, the people who uh, contributed to the, to the webinar um, have raised for us. Um, so let me introduce Jill and Amanda. Uh, Jill. Jill Frost, I have known as a colleague for many years. Um, she's a hugely experienced counsellor and psychotherapist and teacher in the field uh, for longer than she likes to admit to. Um, and it was out of her a clinical work with a client, uh, Vivian, who it emerged in the course of the work was the ID that Jill wrote the story of the girls within. And then Amanda Ball, uh, Amanda, she, he, they live with DID uh, and collectively are known as the Eternity System. Uh, as a chartered mar marketer and change agent, Amanda works to make the complexities of living with DID accessible to others by sharing their everyday experiences. <laughs> Amanda has had a long professional career and has held senior posts in the agricultural industry. They continue to champion British food. Now, just a couple of other things to say before we get started. Uh, the webinar and this webcast aim alongside of the book to generate awareness and bring real accounts to life from the perspectives, perspectives of a therapist and from the lived experience of people with DID. They're not designed to replace training or therapy. Uh, we are all aware that we may use words and express ideas uh, in this uh, webcast that may be different from the ways that some of you would speak about your own experience of DID. And just to say that we do not intend any disrespect in the words that we will use this evening. So uh, to our first question, um, a number of people asked about recognizing the signs of DID emerging. Um, Jill, would you pick that up and, and uh, talk about it for me? Yeah, thank you, Alf. Um, I think one of the, the things that came up out of the questions was asking not just about signs and symptoms, but also asking was DID on a spectrum. So I thought perhaps the, the best way forward was to start by thinking about dissociation per se, and to think about dissociation, which is something which we all do as human beings, all of us at some stage most days will perhaps not be aware of it, but we dissociate in order to block out uncomfortable feelings, to prevent us from having to be in touch with things that are uncomfortable, painful, or things from the today or from the past. So 
we all dissociate and thankfully we have brains and psyches that enable us to do this automatically and unconsciously. So we're all in the same, same boat called the boat of dissociation. However, the thing is that when children, when they're very young and they're exposed to and experience some very bad trauma, abuse, neglect or other things that terrify or frighten them, something very significant happens, which is different once we get past about the age of six, seven, eight. And this is when we have real problems, when little ones are terrified and they're overwhelmed and they literally don't know how to survive and the psyche automatically sets things into motion so that the memories and the emotions attached to the events get pushed out of consciousness. They become dissociated. So I think the thing is that as, as a therapist, um, trying to recognize signs and symptoms of people who have dissociative disorders is actually quite tricky. But what we know is that children who have extreme trauma in childhood are very, very likely to develop some kind of dissociative disorder. And this is where we go along the spectrum of dissociation. So I guess at this sort of, at the lighter weight of dissociative disorders, we might be with clients who are kind of foggy or they kind of phase out, they're not kind of with it, they're zoning out. And we will notice this and perhaps not be terribly sure what it's all about. Um, and this is maybe because during therapy there's a trigger or a memory has come, to, has come into being. So what we need to know is that there are a number of very important um, different signs of different stages of dissociative disorders. Now, one of the first things we need to think about is dissociative, dissociative amnesia. All these words are making my, a little bit like a tongue twister. So dissociative amnesia. I wonder how many therapists have asked their client to talk about their history, to talk about their childhood. And I guess usually people will have some kind of a coherent story to tell that makes sense, that flows. But with somebody who's got dissociative amnesia, they're very unlikely to be able to have much recall from early years of childhood. And the, and the recall that they do have may not be flowing and may not be sort of um, in line. Um, so that amnesia often is a sign that there may be a disorder of some kind and we need to be conscious and take note of it. Another sign is something called dissociative amnesia with fugue. And this is when um, clients might be telling you or maybe showing you that they find themselves in unknown places with no idea how they got there. So that again is another sign and symptom of a dissociative, a dissociative disorder. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, the next two um, categories. One is depersonalization. Now depersonalization is when um, we feel detached from our body, feeling that our body, our arms and legs may be distorted. And at this point, I have to say that this reminds me of a client I had many years ago, way before I knew about DID. And I remember very clearly her saying to me, do you know something, Jill? Sometimes I feel as if my head is really, really big, like it's swollen, like it's bloated, and it's much, much bigger than my body. And quite frankly, I was, I was just dumbfounded because I had no idea what she, what she was talking about. I had no idea what might be the cause for her to experience this. And then she said, oh, well, maybe it's a family thing because my sister gets it too. But of course, had I had the training, had I had the knowledge, I would have begun to have some clue 
that this might be a sign or a symptom of depersonalization, which is part of a dissociative disorder. Then there comes derealization. This is when the environment doesn't feel real, when ceilings and walls might seem to be moving or blurred, and the distance between objects seems to be distorted. So derealization is yet another sign and symptom. Now then we come to the sixth category that I've got written down here, which is dissociative disorders of movement and sensation. And this involves seizures, loss of sensation and paralysis. And it can be confused with neurological disorders such as epilepsy or strokes. And at this point, I really have to mention my book, um, The Girls Within, because my client that I write about, Vivian, way back in the quite early days or the early years of our time, started to have seizures. And these seizures were so, so pronounced and so frequent that she was literally falling to the ground morning, noon and night, sometimes several times every day. And it was as a result of this that she was taken into hospital um, and the doctors and the psychiatrists who were working with her had no idea what was wrong. So they did tests on her for epilepsy. They came clear and they had no idea. And the one doctor said to Vivian, my client in the book, I'm really sorry, but I think this is just part of your post-traumatic stress because by then they knew that, um, that we, we obviously knew that, that, that she had some very, very, very uh, bad um, abuse and trauma in her past. And the psychiatrist said, you'll just have to go home and live with this. And her reply was, if I have to live like this, I'll kill myself. And I didn't blame her whatsoever. The last two signs of DID, um, rather of dissociative disorders, are the signs of DID, dissociative identity disorder. Um, and of course, what we know is that one of the diagnostic criteria for DID is that someone will have at least two personality states. So that these personalities will usually show themselves. We are perhaps are much more conscious of the type of a presentation of these younger parts or alters as they're called um, because they switch there's a switch by means of which the the younger parts the alters will make themselves known and it'll be very obvious because there'll be a, ch a change of voice mannerism speech vocabulary or body actions the person with the did may not know much about these episodes of coming out when there's a switch but the therapist will be absolutely clear about what's happening. Now, on the other hand, there's a much more subtle presentation when there's a switch or not a switch, but a sort of a change. And that's when the parts don't actually come out, but they do significantly influence the individual. So the individual be in, will be in the grip of these alters. They may be an angry teenager or a frightened child and the change might be um, significant but subtle. So um, really we need to be aware of the fact that, that dissociative disorders are on a, on a very wide scale and DID also has to be understood within that spectrum. And I realize I've been talking for ages, and I do apologize, but, no, but it's really important that we understand that at the beginning. Yeah, lovely, no, thank you, Jill. Um, yeah, Amanda. if I can perhaps just pick yeah. up on a few things um, that Jill was talking about there. I think there's the, it's important to, particularly if I look back at when I started to become aware of some of the dissociative symptoms that Jill has talked about there, and also picking up on some of the uh, questions that, that were asked, some of the, the sort of more granularity around when did I become aware and, you know, what, what might I have noticed looking back. Um, and just at this relatively early stage, I just want to emphasize that, um, as we've already said, the, these are my experiences and everyone um, with uh, uh, dissociative 
identity disorder or, or other, other dissociative disorders experiences symptoms differently, but also it would depend on our stage of um, knowing in terms of, of knowing our internal selves and, and um, other parts to, to use that terminology. Uh, but also it would depend on stage of therapy. So for, for, for me, as we're um, recording this webcast now, I'm relatively still early on in my journey. I seem to have been saying that for a little while, but really I'm at a point where I'm still looking at stabilization skills and getting to know my internal parts. So, you know, hopefully this webcast will have some life. And when I look back in later years, um, I'll recognize that stage I'm at. But I want to kind of pick up really on the sort of pre um, you know, um, the point before I started experiencing uh, what we now know as dissociative mm -hmm. symptoms. And for some people, they may not ever remember not having uh, these um, other aspects, these other identities um, within themselves, because I've certainly got um, friends with just with DID who feel like they've always known their parts, you know, at, from, from a very young age. But for myself, it wasn't until I was in my late 40s. So if I, when I recall take, first taking myself to, to therapy, the sort of step before the, the lid blew off, if you like, in other words, the, um, the dissociative barriers began to sort of come down and I became aware of my other parts. The kind of red flags that I would have wanted the therapist to know back then is <laughs> some of what Jill's already said about significant gaps in my memory history. So I was always saying, I, I really can't remember significant parts of my childhood. And then to, to inquire beyond the normal in that situation, because mm -hmm. let's face it, most people, um, you know, don't have really detailed recollections of their childhood. Uh, secondly, I guess I would have wanted them to spot the fact that I was quite detached. I could explain some really quite dramatic things that happened to me. Um, this is before I started experiencing dissociative symptoms or clearly what was happening then is that I had a, a numbing out, you know, so I was dissociated from my history but I wasn't having typical symptoms of switching and, and depersonalization and derealization so um I I could you know I, I could really quite quite I could describe quite difficult things and just be well that's just what happened didn't it and you know um so this was pre uh me being spotted for a dissociative disorder I guess as well, um, Jill, addictions, you know, so yeah. in, in all manner of different forms, you know, for, for me, uh, mine was looking back, it was, it was keeping myself busy, which is a, which is a form of addiction. Um, for other people, it might be substances or, or other things. Um, and, and I guess j just in general, I mean, that's the way that I presented, mm -hmm. but it's, it's that curiosity with, with a therapist, I think mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the overt signs might actually be a little bit, you know, the overt dissociative symptoms might be quite obvious to spot. But if somebody had sort of tracked back and, you know, started to inquire whether or not, you know, there was anything traumatic that had happened in my childhood, pieced that together with big chunks of amnesia, a sense of not really being attached to my memories or, or my feelings, then, you know, perhaps things would have been picked up for me at an early age. And then if we take us back even further to when I was, you know, little, um, and one of the things that I would urge people to do now, and we covered this a bit in the last uh, webinar, is spotting those signs in young children. Because if, if we look for the red flags and that there is a list of, of things to look out for, for example, it might be a child that seems extraordinarily able to cope and, um, you know, is a, is a little coper and is the one that's just quiet in the corner. It might be some behavioural things. It may be knowing that there are things going on at home and it, it doesn't seem to be affecting the child or it is affecting the child or all the classic sort of signs of, you know, that people now know, thankfully, of, um, you know, perhaps things that, that are more associated with, with abuse and neglect. So we've got lots of opportunities to pick up these dissociative symptoms along the way. The earliest of those and the plea that I would have mm -hmm. is for, for people to be curious at that very early stage. Um, uh, and then, you know, that those are the sorts of things that that I would want people to look out for now, looking back at, at my history. Lovely. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just thinking too, uh, in, in, in a way, it's a difficult balance to strike if, if, some, if, especially a child, I guess, is 
is in many senses functioning well and yet mm -hmm. there there are some curious um something that just doesn't feel quite right uh, and as you say i think you're right in terms of just gentle curiosity and interest um from from a from a therapist or from a gp or from yeah. um someone uh with with some caring role that can perhaps be a turning point mm. right thank you both um the next area that we're i'm going to ask you about is about interacting with parts with alters jill would you pick that up please yes thank you um there were a couple of questions asking about how to interact or address the parts or alters especially when they started to come out and Alf, I remember very clearly um, feeling slightly awkward <laughs> when I first started to meet little Vivi who was six um, when she started coming out and you just looked at me and said well Jill if she's six isn't it simply a question of speaking to her like a six-year-old? <laughs> and, um, and of course, yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, and so to take your sort of message to me a, bit, a little bit further, I guess it depends on the age, the presentation, and the mood of the, the young ones or slightly old ones when they actually do come out. And so there's something about remembering that the young parts want to come out, um, there's a reason for this. Usually they're bursting with emotion and they're wanting to come out to start to talk about what's, what they're feeling like. They're bursting to come out to find somebody who will be there to listen to them, to believe them, to accept them and to respect them. So, um, you know, I think alters will usually come or come out when the therapist when the therapist and the setting feels safe to them as a rule but I, i'm not quite sure amanda whether you'd uh, agree with that from your own personal experience yeah and I, I, I know we're, we're also you know you and i are also going to cover the the topic of when they don't as well because that's certainly yeah. in, the, in the conversations that i have online with uh with other people with did there there are sometimes when you know once that once that trust has been developed that um you know any part of, of, of any age and, and it's also worth recognizing at this part that certainly for myself um uh, myself and somebody that, that you work with jill predominantly parts were younger whereas there are also lots of people yeah. with uh you know <laughs> with, with with older parts particularly people who have um, who have parts that are sort of internal uh, helpers. Um, but yeah, I, for me, it, it's safety in, in its kind of broadest sense, because certainly if, um, if I think about when I'm attending therapy, the, the slightest noise or if, um, if there's a view out of the window that can be distracting or the physical aspects of the therapy room, you know, whether a chair is confi um, uh, confining, whether there's a comfortable space on the floor. Uh, so there are, there are lots of things to consider within the therapeutic space, as well as the um, relationship and the trust feeling right. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Um, and, I, and I think that kind of leads on to that, that, that the next um, area of, a, of questioning about this whole a topic of how to address or talk to parts. Um, and a couple of people asked how to encourage parts to come out, especially when they've gone missing in order to help the client. Um, and I suppose um, for me, again, that sounds so simple, but it doesn't necessarily feel simple in the room. And if I said, well, by invitation, that may sound too simple to be true. Um, and I'd just like to sort of explain a little of my training um, over many years, which has been working with the parts of ourselves and our clients as being a very natural way of working. Um, so working with young dissociated parts for me isn't such a huge leap, but um, 
if we if we take for example the model of internal family systems um which is very much a concept of the fact that that all of us with or without dissociative disorders have an internal family systems made up of many parts younger parts older parts different kinds of parts such as mother parts or warrior parts or jealous parts or whatever but if we, if we take um, seriously the idea that we are all multiples, and this is what internal family systems does, is the idea is that when we're sitting in front of a, a client, we're talking to our client who may be a 40 year old woman or a 50 year old man, but they also bring with them unseen their internal family system. And so, when I was working with people who, who had DID, it was just an extension of that concept really, which was um, if a part had gone missing and they were very much uh, needed or they would have been welcomed to come into the foreground again and play a significant part in the therapy, then I would simply, or to obviously talk it through with my, my, my client, and say, well, I think it's a good idea perhaps that we invite this part of you that seems to have gone missing and invite that part to come forward, to come out, maybe to have a conversation or to show themselves. And I would um, explain to that part who wasn't visible. So if anybody walked into the room, they probably thought I might have gone slightly um, off my trolley. I would be sitting talking to my client and I would be saying, I'd like to talk to this particular um, part. Maybe it's an angry teenager who's gone missing for a while, but the teenager is necessary for the next part of the therapy. And so I would address that part. And I would say that it's very important if they're willing to come, to come out maybe, because they've been missed and they're wanted and they're needed. And they've been so very helpful in the past and they could be so very helpful now. And would they be willing to come out to talk about things? And invariably, um, I don't know whether um, it's just, I, I don't have years and years and years of, and many, many people with DID, but it certainly is a case that on the whole, these parts that were invited usually replied or they usually responded. I think that, that's, yeah, that, that's a useful point as well, I think, to kind of talk about. So there's those aspects of um, people without dissociative disorders who can identify with, you know, their inner child or the, or the aspects that you've talked about. And then there's those of us with DID um, who know we have parts, uh, you know, at the point at which we've, we've, we've realised we've got DID. And... Uh, certainly for, for ourselves and from listening to others, there's this um, almost like uh, different ways in which we become aware of our levels of what we, all, what we talk about as co-consciousness. And so when people talk about, I can't reach a part of me, I'm, I'm worried that they've gone missing, you know, and, and another, another way of describing that might be that an alter or a part has gone dormant for a while. You know that, that sometimes that happens and, and if we look back over over my timeline there would have been parts of me that have been dormant for maybe even decades and so i think that there's the difference between uh a part sort of in the background observing um you know that they may be playing an observing role and there might be a part of me listening in now to what we're talking about but they're sort of waiting in the wings or observing and you know, wondering whether or not they want to talk to the therapist and if they've got something to contribute. There are parts that are buried really deep that might not even be making a conscious decision whether or not mm -hmm. they come forward because it may just be too soon. It may be that, that our mind isn't yet quite ready to, right. you know, release some of those memories. Um, and then there's also the concept of, um, which we don't experience, but I know it's it's seen as quite an important thing for some people with DID is what we might call masking, which is where it may well be that it, even sometimes it can come through as um, uh, sort of influence. You know, there might be some sort of influence from another part that 
is influencing my way of, of thinking. Um, and I'm losing Amanda here, the everyday parts kind of ability to separate mm. somebody else's thought process from, from my own. Um, and so the ways in which we all experience DID can be very different at any point in time and aren't clear cut. The, the edges can get blurred. We can be blended, which is different than co-conscious. Mm. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, these questions right. about parts that have gone very deep, generally speaking, they've gone, they've gone deep for a reason. And, and yeah. we also have to sort of respect the, um, the intelligence almost of our, of our, both our nervous system and our, um, our part system. Sure. I just wanted you to expand a little bit on blended, uh, blended as opposed to co-conscious. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. How I see that really is, um, particularly if I've just switched. So um, if I've either been triggered out, if I've been triggered out negatively, in other words, there's been either a, an internal trigger, a, a, a physical trigger, an emotional trigger that's been generated from the inside, um, you know, be that a pain, a body memory, be that even an illness sometimes can, can trigger another young part out that it might, it might sort of trigger something from a younger age or an external trigger, um, as in, you know, a smell or something on the news and those sorts of things. Or it might even be when we've been what we call positively triggered out. So there, there would be certain cues almost that a lot of people with DID will know that will pull out a certain part. So when I've been, when I've switched, and I'm then maybe coming back into the body, essentially, taking over control perhaps of the body, either because the other part of me is scarpered or, um, <laughs> or I'm being called back to, to ground for, in, in therapy. I get that point where I'm still almost, I've got this, it might even be a part of my body. It might be a part of my mind. It might be my speech. So quite often my vocal cords are still be blended with another part of me. Um, the co-consciousness uh, is more of about, for us anyway, it's more of an awareness of what another part is doing at any one time that I might be speaking and another part might be co-conscious, they might be aware of everything that I'm doing and we might be able to sort of fluidly switch in and out. And then just to confuse things even more, they might be almost like co-fronting. So you literally might get a kind of double switch quite quickly between two different parts. But that blended sense is really quite disorientating because I can literally have other body parts still being, and so can the other parts of me. You could have other body parts um, still being held and blended with a, another, you know, for example, with me, quite often I can't move my legs if I've been in a very young state. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly I can tell often my vocal cords are, are very, very different when I'm, when I'm blended. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and maybe that that's that's a, a point Jill, to sort of just talk about that day to day management of, of living with parts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, sorry, were you going to say something else? I was just going to invite you back in, Jill. So. Oh, that's Go right. Ahead. I mean, I was um, there was uh, taking this on one step further. There was another question. Um, how do you work with self sabotaging parts? Mm -hmm. Um, which is, um, you know, a very, very important question because there will always be self-sabotaging parts um, appearing at certain times. And, I, and I, I would be interested to obviously to hear what, what you have to say, Amanda, about this. But uh, going back to internal family systems, it, what, their, sort of, their framework of, of understanding is that there are three different groups of... Um, of types, says the exiles who are the little frightened young ones who hold on to memories of traumatic times and the associated emotions. There are the managers who basically keep the show on the road. There's, you know, the, the working mar manager or the mother manager. Um, and the managers are very, very good at keeping um, life as normal as possible for all of us, but particularly this is the case with somebody with DID. And then we come to the third category, which IFS call the firefighters. 
And these are like the um, emergency 999 sort of services. So that when the little ones get triggered very badly and the managers can't keep the show on the road and they can't do enough soothing, um, the firefighters may come out. And these, this is where, you know, when you were talking a bit earlier, Amanda, about looking for, you know, for signs of addiction or um, things like being a workaholic or needing drink or drugs to get through situations. Well, the IFS um, in sort of way of looking at it is that these are the firefighters who come to try to put the, the emotional fire out when it's absolutely out of control. So when an individual and the collective internal family system feels that it's absolutely going completely um, sort of to a point where um, it's totally intolerable, they may, there's a, the firefighters may suggest to the individual that they need a drink, they need to shoot up with heroin, they may need to um, perhaps self-harm, or they may even decide if the worst comes to the worst, that suicide is um, the only way out. And I think that what we actually get with self-sabotaging parts probably may come from the firefighters who um, are actually trying to do something helpful, but it looks as if it's really going against the internal family system. So, um, you know, once again, it's a case of addressing the self-sabotaging parts. And if it's possible to try to talk to them about what they're doing, and if these parts are willing to come out, if they've been out before and you can encourage them to come out again, to have a conversation, is that you can talk to them about why they're distressed, why they're acting in this way, and to invite them to communicate with you to find other ways of managing the distress. Um, I'm yeah, thinking, I'm sorry. Be, yep, uh, I'm thinking there will be times when the, the therapy itself is experienced as uh, a real threat to the individual. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So, yeah, so part of some of these parts will be dead against therapy. <laughs> Yeah, yes, but they're, yeah. trying to, they're trying to save the, to save the whole system, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and so, actually, if you can get, get to talk to them and say, actually, you're doing a great job. I understand, you know, I understand what you're trying to do. But it's a question, really, of helping them to see what they're doing, why they're doing it, and to understand the part that the therapist is playing is actually we're on the same side here we're working together you know i'm i'm on your side i'm part of your team really yeah. but i don't know yeah how... and I, I think the other thing that's um however we categorize parts whether we use um the internal family systems model whether we use uh what's known as action systems you know uh, mm -hmm. uh in terms of um you know, human interactions, or whether we look at brain anatomy. So for example, you know, then there might be parts that are more visually orientated. There might be parts that have got more auditory memory. Uh, and so um, how the internal family system, you know, just to use that in its broadest sense, rather than just from an IFS yeah. point of view, is structured, it is obviously pretty, it's sophisticated and it's been done for a reason. Um, and when I'm thinking about how we manage and, and how we deal with, you know, whether it's a shutdown or whether it's despair or whether it's, you know, um, feeling sort of hyper in terms of our emotions being off the scale or being completely shut down, uh, you know, the, the knowledge that I've got now about um, that I've really sort of spent some time learning about in terms of our nervous system and, and the polyvagal theory um, you know, a lot of that makes sense in terms of how your nervous system changes when you're in certain emotional states. But one thing that's really, really, really important here as well is to remember um, that even for those who are blessed with being able to sit in a room with a trusted therapist and have managed to find a trusted therapist and, you know, dare I say, also not being um, harmed in its broadest sense of the word through poor therapy or um, you know, inappropriate therapy. 
uh, we have pretty much um, not quite 24 seven, my, you know, minus the therapy time, but we've got to find ways of coping on our own as well. Mm. Uh, and the, from, from our perspective, um, we don't have yet, and, and there will be some people with DID that do, and, and we sadly don't. Mm. A lot of people have what's known as a, a, an inner world uh, and where their parts are able to interact with one another um, in the inside landscape. Some of those for some people are quite visual. Um, some of them are really, really, you know, have a sense of realness. Part of my amnesia is I have what's known as aphantasia in that I can't visualize. So we don't have as such an inner world and we're not yet even fully aware, all of us, that we are a part of, you know, a part of a whole or an identity that makes, that makes up, um, you know, our dissoci dissociated identities. Uh, and so when you have, a, as, as I do, a sort of a young nine-year-old male part of me, as far as he's concerned, he, he, he is him. Um, and when you're, you know, when, when you're trying to, when, when he's distressed, because he's a trauma holder of, certain, of, of a certain type, um, then I yet haven't got the ability to reach him. Uh, and so I yet don't have the ability to, he can't self-soothe. And so he's only reliant on the time that he can spend in the therapy room to, to, to learn how to navigate everyday, everyday life. And so some of those um, issues around dysphoria, um, and some of the issues around uh, de, uh, depersonalization are, are very, mm. very real. Uh, and so I think what's, what's worth remembering here is we, we can talk about how we help support those parts in therapy, but uh, individuals learning from, from others with DID that are further down their journey is, is a huge part of our community now. And you know, mm. I, I simply wouldn't be where I am now if it weren't for other people with DID mm. um, helping, helping us and, yeah. and learning from, from each other. Um, and so in terms of how my parts interact, they, they actually don't yet, but they, I hope it is a yet. They, they, they do in the sense that it's almost like a passing of a hot potato and one part will come in and sweep up where another part can't manage and we'll switch in and out. Uh, but um, we're not yet at a point where we can almost call on each other or that we've got the internal communication. And, uh, and I obviously I, I hope that that over time that will that will change. Um, and so a lot of early on in therapy, a lot of the work is around actually, you know, sort of psychoeducation, learning and trying to find an age appropriate way of explaining why we came about. Then there's the whole acceptance process of what we are. And, and actually, in order to know what we are as a team, we need to understand ourselves as individuals to start with. You know, the, the sort of concept of knowing oneself before you can work out how you all fit in as part of the team. Um, and then being able to, to regulate these, you know, all of these this new landscape of emotions. That huge work that has to be done in stabilization, either on your own, and or hopefully with the help of a therapist um, it, it is a big part of this in terms of, um, you know, really being able to live on a day-to-day -day basis with DID. Um, and the way that I experience what some people might, you know, label as sort of self-sabotaging is, is almost sometimes a safety valve, we shut down. Um, and so our kind of way is, is sometimes it's a helpful uh, kind of, you know, it, it's almost like we've got, no other way of dealing with this than just to shut down and a part will will come in and we'll shut down you know as in we'll we'll be very very you know depressed unable to move um and uh you know not not really able to engage with everyday life very easily and might that last for a, a day or a number of days or how might, how might that go? yeah i mean for some people it particularly <laughs> if um, they're, they're feeling a, a sense of hopelessness or there are a lot of external triggers or the environment that they're living in um, or, you know, be those financial worries, be those overload with symptoms, then it could last for quite some time. You know, at the point of, of us recording this, I, I'm in, a, in a, uh, a stage where one of my parts is, is sort of very heavily weighing down on the, the despair side of, of things because 
Um, we, we, we don't feel able to manage our symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. So that could go on for the days. Other times, it, 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 it could be a real sort of rush of emotion and then another part's in and bang, we're up, up regulated, you know, and, and we're, we're off again. So I think a lot of it depends on the severity of the symptoms and, and what support people have got around them to, you know, to help them, not just in therapy, but in terms of, uh, you know, everyday life. That, that must be a very important aspect of, of managing from day to day. Uh, other people, family, friends. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, there was this question as well, you know, Jill, about um, how do I experience switching and dissociation? Yeah. Uh, now, I can talk about it, how I see it from <laughs> inside of us, and then maybe you can... So yeah. talk about that, the observing aspect of when somebody's switching or, or dissociative symptoms. So even when we were starting, for example, we were, you were talking about um, depersonalization. We have a, a huge thing at the moment about my head being too big because my younger parts literally, were, I struggle to even feel my head feels like I need to hold it up. So you will see me propping myself quite a lot. But my, my dissociation could, could be everything, nor at the whole range of what you described early on. In terms of a switch, um, and again, this is different for everyone with DID, but it certainly isn't the way that, that it's often portrayed in Hollywood with lots of sort of, you know, um, flashy lights. And, you know, it's, sometimes it's very overt. For us, it's very overt, very obvious, because my parts are um, all a, a lot younger than me and all speak very differently to me. But with some people with DID, you might not even notice it. You know, there might the, the speech might be very, very similar. Mm. Um, how I experience it is that sometimes I'll I'll get a feeling that I know I'm going to switch, mainly when I start to become uh, emotional. So anything that brings me close to my emotions, then I can feel that I'm not used to handling emotions. My trauma holding parts are very adept at holding emotions, and it's kind of like an escape route, really. It's like, boof, they'll come in and, and I'm gone. I'm, I've switched and I'm gone. And for me, when I'm switched to another part, I've, I've got no awareness that some people have. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when I'm then, when I then come back and I, I, we have intense headaches, lots of people with DID have very intense headaches. If I don't allow a switch, and this is my challenge, is that, I, I spend most of my time suppressing switching and that's because I know the other parts of me are very, very, very emotional um, and, and very young. So it's a protective mechanism as well. My head literally feels like it might explode. You know, that the energy that it takes to hold in for, for us is, is equal to the energy that is, is used up and, in order to switch and, and how tired we are afterwards. So, um, yeah, the, the process of identity alteration at my stage in my healing journey, and it will be, you know, different for people that are further down and they're more co-conscious and switching isn't quite so harsh. Um, it, it is, whew, yeah, pretty exhausting when I allow myself to feel it. <laughs> uh, and Jill, you know, you, you obviously will... Um, we'll see verbal cues and body cues and all sorts of things, I would think, when you're observing switching happening. Yes, and, and I, I, think, I think there's a very important issue here for, for therapists and people with DID alike, in a way, during therapy. And that is that initially, I mean, and I need to preempt this by saying, actually, that I am no expert expert in terms of working with DID clients. I have only worked with two uh, fully fledged DID clients. One of them is my book client, Vivian, and the other one was you, Amanda. So, um, and of course, it all happened to me at, at a time when I had had no training. I didn't know what was going on. And so it was literally learning almost as I went along trying to get some extra training, reading books and so on. And I, and I remember very well the very, very first time I experienced Vivian switching and little Vivi coming out was that um, I could just sense that there was um, it was almost like electricity in in the room in a funny sort of way and Vivian sort of her eyes started to flicker 
and she went very quiet as if she was going literally within herself. And within seconds, there was this almost a bursting out, as little Vivi said to me for the very first time of meeting, hello, Jill. And that was it. And she was out then for the next, oh, I don't know, until the end of the session, probably for half an hour. But, and, you know, her mannerisms, her, her voice, her everything was that of a six-year-old. And for the first, probably for the first six to 12 months of working with Vivian, um, the switches happened when the parts decided they wanted to come out. Well, actually it was little Vivi to start with alone. Um, and so she would come out either when she was triggered by things or when she wanted to tell me something or wanted to um, share with me feelings or thoughts. And then I remember, this is a, again, something which was blindingly obvious once you'd said it out. You said, well, have you ever thought about inviting her out when you need to invite her out uh, or when it might be helpful I thought oh gosh how do we do <laughs> how do we do that because again it's all these things that sound so simple and yet it's so outside of my realm our realm of experience and understanding so um, we tried it um, and after that nearly always it was by invitation that she came out um, although, you know, if she couldn't wait, she'd some, sometimes surprise me and laugh and think it was a huge joke that she hadn't been invited out and she, she was kind of almost gate crashing. But, um, and then of course there's the other um, end of it about how if a part is out, particularly if you're in the middle of a therapy session and you only work to a 50 or 60 minute um, sort of appointment, um, how on earth, do you manage the part that's out at the end of the session? In other words, how do you invite them to go back within if that's necessary before they go? And um, that was something actually, Amanda, that I have a lot, a lot to thank you for because we worked out together, didn't we? How, if your parts were out by the end of the therapy session, how we might find a way of asking them to return within. And, um, you know, there was so much to learn and you and your parts have taught me <laughs> more than I can ever express really. So it's, um, it is a very complex topic that we're talking about. And as you say, Amanda, everybody with DID presents differently, their parts are different. And, you know, I feel almost, you know, I've, I've got my, you know, my L, plates on still in a way because I feel like I'm not an expert but I'm an expert perhaps of Vivian and a partial expert when it comes to you Amanda but um but I'll never be a full full expert like you guys are <laughs> so I think that's that kind of is that's that enough you think? No, that's lovely yes thank you Let, let's um let's move it on another area that people asked about uh, this was from therapists I think asking about um therapeutic boundaries and yes. Different <laughs> in working with someone with DID. Yes. <laughs> well, this is like a hot potato, isn't it, Alf? <laughs> um, well, the thing is that um, traditionally having firm boundaries is a vital thing to have in order to create um, a sort of a therapeutic frame within which safe work can take place between two individuals having the therapy. So um, I obviously had, had been trained, uh, my experience was to have firm boundaries. And when I work with you, Alf, I mean, you are the master of all firm boundaries. So, so that just added to my sense of the, ne the necessity and also the value of having these firm boundaries. But the point is when you're working with traumatized and often quite terrified young parts, it becomes quite a different matter. So when these little ones are in the grip of terror, they can't actually wait till next Wednesday when the next appointment is. They have no concept of it. It's rather like a child waking up in the middle of the night, um, having had a nightmare, and they kind of would rush into their 
parent or parent's bedroom and say, you know, I'm terrified. Can I get into your bed? Can I tell you about my dream or whatever it may be? You know, the parent is not going to say, well, hang on a minute, sweetie. Um, can you just go back to bed? Um, because we've got meetings in the morning and we'll talk about it tomorrow. Even that is too much for little ones to cope with. So um, I think the thing is that when you're working with somebody with DID, the, the main thing is that you are essentially working with often younger parts who are at times quite terrified when they're reminded of the things that happened to them that overwhelmed them or scared them to death almost. So as Valerie Sinison says, um, it's not a question of breaking boundaries. It's necessary to have contact with your, with your client or the little ones in between sessions. It's much more a case of working out of hours. And as she says, it's not a nine to five job. It's not nine to five work when you work with people with DID. So another quote of Valerie's is that boundaries with DID need to be a breathing, flexible issue. Um, now in The Girls Within, um, I allow the reader to see and feel my journey of flexing my boundaries to create out of hours contact. Um, it was probably the most, one of the most difficult aspects of working as a therapist with DID because it just felt so alien to me and also really, really uncomfortable. And um, I have to admit, I often felt quite out of, out of control, but the way I work with it, as you know, Alf, is that you and I spent many, many, many hours discussing just how far we could or needed to flex the, the boundaries in order to make it beneficial for um, for everyone concerned, but particularly for these traumatized little ones. So it was a very, very important to understand, and this is something Amanda reminded me of only this week, that it's what's inside the boundary that's the important thing. And we often don't look at it that way. And I think um, that in The Girls Within, the flexing of the boundaries was necessary for a time, but not forever. Mm -hmm. So there was a time when little Vivi um, in between sessions would be, would come out at home and would be overwhelmed with distress about something. And Vivian's husband, um, he just, Marcus just couldn't cope. And, but we had, a, we had an agreement that for a period of time, if it was an emergency, if little Vivi really, really couldn't cope and she was so distressed that she could phone me up and she could phone me up, it had to be on my landline, not my mobile. And if I wasn't in, that was bad for her, but it was just the way it was. But if I was in, I would speak to her. Speak to her. And in the book, um, I go into great detail at, in one or two of the chapters about the, the difficulty and the I, I guess it's just a huge challenge to therapists as, as to how you handle this, because there is such a lot of um, challenge involved in terms of how and when and what does it look like when you say you'll have contact. And every therapist needs to make their own decision, talking with the client and talking in supervision. I think it's absolutely vital that we all have a, a sense of um, as therapists, that we're not making this decision on our own, and we're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that sort of aspect of co-creation is important. And one thing that that I I would urge always is for even if the therapist feels like they're they're raising it, not to raise it in the sense that the client's going to feel that they're too much, and therefore, you know, are we raising the issue of boundaries again because you've overstepped them? But, but to almost sort of set the, the frame when we're starting to work together to say, because of everything that Jill's just talked about, you know, because there will be um, periods of time where particularly at the beginning, where we need co-regulation, we, we need other people to, to help hold the, you know, the enormity of what we're experiencing. 
um, in an ideal world. And that co-regulation can obviously come from other people. I don't mean um, necessarily overt parenting as such, but you know, co-regulations, you know, can literally just be talking to somebody else. Um, but for the for the therapist to really take it on board. To, um, to, to raise issues around boundaries and keep the communication open. Mm -hmm. Because what I spot time after time after time is that we are, you know, not just ourselves, but other people with DRD, we are petrified of overstepping boundaries. We are petrified of being too much. We are petrified of being rejected, doing the wrong thing, contacting too much. Um, and maybe that we're more likely actually to hold off um, and try and manage our, ourselves mm. and not reach out and it gets to a point of, of um, you know, really significant distress before we will ask for help because that's kind of in, our, in the nature of most people with DID is, 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 is to have coped on, on their own. Uh, and, and this also goes down to things around um, how people, you know, it might be simple things like signing off emails you know that how do we sign off emails how do we talk to one another <laughs> what expressions do we use um you know because we will analyze every little thing that once once that trust and, and that attachment is formed with the therapist um then we, we as people with did because we're used to being hyper vigilant we're used to being um you know watching every move of other people uh we'll pick up on those subtleties so so help us out, really, I guess, is what, what I'm urging by, you know, but ju just saying, how, how, how do we think it's going? And of course, we really, really need boundaries. Um, but it is about that ongoing discussion about, you know, what comes within it. Um, so it's not that we don't need firm boundaries. We do. Those are really important. Um, and and it, safe boundaries in the, in the broadest sense of the word. Um, but to urge the therapist to, to think about boundaries in all sorts of ways, not just contact, but sign offs, disclosure. Um, so, you know, a boundary around, for example, Jill, you might have been used to not disclosing to your clients when you had things <laughs> that were happening in your world. Whereas um, most people with DID can pick up on subtleties when a therapist hasn't slept very well the night before. <laughs> and then we start to worry, we start to worry that it's something that we might have said or done if, if that's not explained. Is that, yeah. is that kind of, is that your experience, Jill? Absolutely, yes, quite right. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it, it, is, it is a very different way of working. And I have to say that I don't know that it's a way of working that would suit every therapist. But, it, but if you have a heart f for the work and you have a heart for this way of working, then it can be invaluable. And so we, we, I think each therapist needs to decide how far they can go and whether they want to, to, to be part of this kind of healing. I, I mean, I would actually say that it's the most enriching therapy that I ever did. And, you know, I learned so much from it, but, it, but it, as you say, it is complex and one has to keep, um, once you've embarked on starting it, you need to keep checking and checking it out with, with your client and with yourself that things are going in the right direction. I think what you're describing too is, is very, very demanding um, work of a therapist. And, and you've said it a couple of times, but I would want to reiterate it, that um, think, thinking all the time uh, with, with a colleague, with a supervisor about actually what, what's going on. I think quite an important moment in, in your, yours and my work with uh, Vivian was, was that point where it kind of became clear that uh, anger at your unavailability when you were unavailable was being carefully avoided by little Vivi getting uh, getting um, access to you whenever she wanted it and and actually then at that point when that was realized um, firming up on the boundary talking to little Vivi about it as you did Jill and 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 the frustration and the uh, pain and having to having to find ways to cope in your absence was a really yeah. important part of the, the development. Absolutely right, yeah, yeah. It's all very, very enriching work. You know, it's uh, complex, but but wonderful. Mm. 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 Let me just add another thought here, um, which is that uh, the research shows that um, 
clients who have suffered uh, severe boundary violations in their early life, clients who've suffered uh, physical abuse and sexual abuse, um, very often uh, uh, a key part of the work is around boundaries. And, and uh, again, often there will be there will be demands made by by a client out of this traumatized place um, that that need a lot of care. And again, I think we as therapists we need to uh, take on board the the weight of uh, responsibility and demand that can be upon you, and really look after yourself yeah. in terms of having support in thinking about what's happening and understanding it and yeah. how to manage it. Yeah. Amanda, did, did you want to come in there? Yeah, I, I, what's going through my mind is, um, uh, you know, we, we're talking about expressions of uh, care and uh, the, the L word is coming to mind, love. Hmm. <laughs> um, you know, because uh, that's another thing that, that, that often younger parts will, well, certainly in our experience, will start to wonder and challenge and want to know, you know, uh, this these, this person that I'm trusting, do they love me? Um, you know, and, and as you were saying, now some of that can get sort of all in, 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 intermingled with um, perhaps some early experiences that, that that may not have been quite so safe. So you know, that whole area of um, how love is expressed, certainly for us, uh, understanding different types of love, um, and that you know, love can be expressed through care from the therapist. But it's, it's something that also occupies the minds of people with DID is, is this question around, you know, um, does, does my therapist love me um, and are we wanted and, and, and all that sort of thing. So, you know, we're, we're covering some fairly taboo subjects here, but it's important. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to make this webcast and, and the previous webinar. Mm. Bill, do you want to come in there? Yeah, and I mean, I think we're now on, <coughs> on the next question. So, so if I need to take your role over from you. I segued into that, Jill, you see. <laughs> you what, sorry? I segued us into that one. <laughs> <laughs> you, you certainly did, because the next question that the questionnaire um, has got in front of me is, do you believe love from a therapist is important when working with DID? And, you know, I've got written down here, love is a taboo issue often in the world of therapy. Um, but I'd like to ask a question in reply to that question. And, and the question I've written down here is, what do clients or patients need from therapists for there to be a positive therapeutic relationship? And we all know that a good therapy relationship is vital for there to be a good outcome to therapy. So I've compiled a list here, which I, I did off the top of my head um, earlier today. And I've got like a shopping list of things that the therapist in an ideal world needs to offer or to have or to be. Um, so the therapist needs to offer acceptance, recognition, empathy, kindness, warmth, a tug towards tenderness, meeting a client where they are, and then besides things like caring, um, to caring for, the, for the, the client, caring for the whole space, there's a whole other thing to do with generosity. Generosity of spirit, generosity of heart. There's a generosity of mentalization, which is what you were talking about, Alf, being generous to allow the client to, to have a lot of time in one's head, you know, to, to give them time of thinking about them and a generous involvement with the whole process and with the whole internal family system as well as the client. And above and beyond all else, maybe the sense of I'm with you. I'm with you. You're not, you're not on this, in this journey alone. And also we've touched on this, the ability to bear, to bear conflict as well as love. So, you know, when you were saying, Alf, about little baby getting angry with me because I wasn't always at the end of the telephone, mm. I had to be able to bear it and help her bear it and talk about it and work through it. But we've also got to, to, to bear 
the love that they may have for us as therapists or the love that we might have. And when we look at that shopping list, it looks and sounds a lot like love to me. Um, and so I don't, I think there's the answer is that all the things that in an ideal world, a therapist needs to be able to offer a client, but particularly so with somebody with DID, adds up to love. And I can honestly say that I was very conscious, I'm still very conscious of loving um, Vivian and her, and her internal parts, and also loving you, Amanda, as your therapist and, um, and loving your parts. And without that capacity, I don't think that there would be a successful outcome. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, that, that anyone listening to this, if, if anyone's at all concerned that we're, you know, we're talking about things that might stray into dangerous ethical issues, we're, we're talking about um, human relationships. Yeah. And we're, 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 we are, I just want to emphasise that we are talking about, you know, obviously safe and bounded love and, and that sort of thing. But it is important that, you know, we, what we're discussing as well is people often, very, very often, um, in fact, I haven't yet met other people that haven't had some kind of, um, you know, significant attachment wounding uh, with, with DID. Uh, and, and so therefore, you know, we, we were harmed either intentionally or, or I have to emphasize as well, unintentionally in relationship, whether that's people being separated at birth because of medical interventions, uh, whether that's, you know, through um, unavailability of, of, a, of a caregiving figure is that you know we we uh, we missed out in some way um, in relationship and therefore we need to be healed in relationship and so you know whether one puts all that together and labels it love um, but I, I think we we couldn't get by without addressing this area because it did come up a lot in, in the question so uh, I think that's that's probably a good one to wrap up on that but yeah it, it's Certainly we, we, we can, we feel it by way of knowing that we are in the minds of the therapist, which often yeah. we struggle to hold on to that as soon as we leave the room because of lack mm. of object permanence. So uh, that, that is certainly makes a big difference for us. Mm. Mm. I just would add the thought just about reliability that, that, mm -hmm. that the therapist is reliably there when they say they'll be there and then uh, we'll also take real care over when they're not there and be reliable and be absolutely true to their word as an expression of, of love. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. All right, let's, let's move on. Um, the next uh, issue we want to raise is about um, the various treatments um, for DID. People asked about a number of things. Um, uh, EMDR was mentioned, uh, focusing and inner work. Uh, internal family systems, Jill, you've already mentioned, and someone asked about pharmacological treatment. Wonder, could, uh, could you have a go addressing those, Jill? Yes, certainly. Um, I, think, I, I think I can only really speak from my own personal experience of the, um, of the, the three things which I, I, I found absolutely essential. And one was that the therapy was relational. At the heart of our work together, it was always based on the relational aspect of what was happening between the two of us. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was absolutely key. And I think working with somebody with DID, that again is absolutely vital because each part needs to feel that they're going to be in a relationship with the therapist. And it's through that relationship that, that, that the therapy and the healing is made possible. In addition to that, um, my original training was um, according to a psychodynamic model, which makes sense of the past and its impact on the present. And so for me, it's an automatic thing that I would be looking for cues or clues in somebody's history to make sense of what's going on in the here and now, in the room, in the relationship and so on. So for me, um, my psychodynamic model of working was incredibly important. And then last of all, um, 
I remember, Alf, when you said to me, once we knew that Vivian definitely had DID and um, little Vivi had started coming out, you said to me, you're going to need more than talking therapy if you're really, really going to help this client of yours with her younger traumatized parts. And you handed me a book by Phil Molon, which was all about the energy treatments available, the energy psychotherapy, which you admitted you didn't know very much about, but I actually knew nothing. <laughs> so you knew, that you, you knew considerably more than I did. And as a result of that, I went and trained in one particular model. I'm not saying it's better than any of the others, but it was my choice for various reasons. And it, it suited me incredibly well as a therapist and it worked with dramatically um, uh, one outcomes in, in the end, but it was an energy treatment or therapy called AIT, which is an acronym for Advanced Integrative Therapy. And basically energy work really helps to focus on the embodied trauma that's been held within the body. And it, it enables the embodied trauma to be processed and also to be um, um, extinguished, not extinguished, but um, taken out of the body. Um, and for me, those three combinations of having a relational therapy, having a psychodynamic model and working energetically were, were things that I couldn't have done without. Um, but that's my experience. And I would hate to think that other therapists would feel I'm saying it'll only work well, um, working with DID, working according to my recipe, but my recipe suited me and it also suited Vivian in the book. And although Amanda, you and I never managed to get around to, to doing the energy treatment, I mean, I think we, it was a very relational um, way of, of operating. And of course I did work psychodynamically with you and also yeah, with yeah. IFS. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the whole idea of, um, uh, or the area, should I say, of, of energy work or, or somatic work is that very definitely uh, something that I would have, I, I just didn't know until I started experiencing um, significant symptoms and particularly some of the pre-verbal um, embodied feelings that we have uh, is that yes there is definitely a sense in us that not all of this can be talked out and the reason not all of it can be talked out is because some of it there is no narrative because mm -hmm. um, some of what we experienced is 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 pre-verbal um, or we simply haven't got the language mm -hmm. and you know most people watching this webinar will, will be familiar with the likes of Peter Levine and you know, and Bessel van der Kolk and, and there's, you know, lots and lots of really good work out there to, to go and learn about how trauma is, is held in, in the body. And, you know, for us, um, without movement, I, I think it, it's about movement, you know, there's that saying, isn't there, emotion has motion, um, is that there, there's, there's about trying to understand and process and talk through and um, be in, in the company of a therapist, but there's also this aspect of the significant amount that is held in our bodies, be that tension or body memories, and somehow that needs to be metabolized. Uh, yeah. and what, whatever modality or method is used, then I think it's for, for therapists to remain open to the fact that, um, you know, there may, may well need to be a carefully crafted um, dual approach where you know, maybe not not all experiences sit within one person. And I know, again, that's a tricky area uh, when people look at, um, you know, working alongside other therapists. But, you know, for us, yeah, that's why I mentioned earlier on about understanding my nervous system. You know, I would, I would urge anybody, I wish I'd learned more about how our autonomic nervous system works much, much earlier in my healing journey. Uh, because understanding why our bodies are acting the way that they are because of the, 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 the nervous system state that our body might be in at any one time and therefore what might help mm -hmm. when you're in that dissociated state, either you know, hypo or hyper aroused or shut down, free state, whatever, 
then I'd say a good grounding in in understanding the autonomic nervous system is mm. yeah. would certainly yeah. have helped me really. Mm. All right. Um, just uh, just to add something there, uh, as far as I'm aware, there's no uh, evidence at all that um, drug treatments, pharmacological yeah. treatment of of uh, dissociative disorders is is specifically um, indicated. Yeah. But there might be times with someone with uh, uh, severe anxiety or uh, depression where a psychiatrist might might um, uh, offer some uh, medication as a kind of um, symptom management, but not specifically treating dissociative yeah. disorder. Mm. Yeah. That's right, and, and we we refer here to the international guidelines that that do that do um, talk about this area, and yeah, ma managing symptoms. Um, you know, some people may seek medication or be advised to have medication with symptoms. And, uh, you know, that, that whole area is, is one that we're not specifically looking to address, but it did come up in questions. Yeah. Um, but it, it's not specifically recommended to treat DID. Uh, and, and we can refer people back to the, uh, to the treatment guidelines on that one. All right, mm. lovely, thank you. Um, what does healing look like? <laughs> Who would like to pick that one up? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, um, it could be a combination of a number of things. It could be a reduction of symptoms. It could be emotional regulation. It could be a harmony within one's internal family or system. It could be that an individual is much more stable and leading a life at work or a social life that kind of feels satisfying and pleasing. Um, it could be that people are internally free of fear or free of the terror that used to dominate and rule them. It could be that they're more confident um, and can go back to work possibly. Um, and these things can occur when the internal family within the internal parts are working together as a team where they're communicating where they're cooperating where they're being compassionate to each other and they're compromising and that is largely seen as when the parts are kind of integrated and of course that's going to be look different and be different for everybody who goes through a healing process with DID and of course um, in my book, The Girls Within, the healing um, is, is actually seen in a rather dreamlike way because the, um, the healing was nothing short of extraordinary. Um, and not everyone with DID sadly will achieve this level of healing that is seen where, where Vivian um, you know, is, I don't want to spoil, spoil the end <laughs> um, of the, for anybody who wants to read the book, but it is a most extraordinary ending. And I think that both Vivian and I were quite concerned um, that the ending might have made people with DID who are reading it feel that it would be an impossible dream. And also Vivian was very, very um, worried that certain people with DID might feel either envy or jealous or feel a sense of, oh my God, it's all right for her, but what about me or what about us? And so it's a sort of, it's an uncomfortable question in terms of what does healing look like? Because often it's not as complete. It's not the way that, that people, be they the, the, the therapist or the person with the DID would ever wish for. But it's, I don't know, perhaps Amanda, you could be better placed to speak about yeah. this. And, and what healing looks like, uh, we, we've certainly touched on this in, in the webinar, is also hugely dependent on resources and, and resources yeah. in, in its, again, in its broadest sense. And whether that's access to therapy, whether it's um, the friends and family network and so on, uh, but also... Um, it's just to, to focus on that word that, that Jill used, which was in integration or integrated, is that the way that we're seeing that is more about the fact that, um, that, that 
memory is able to be shared because it's no longer um, as uh, needed, if you like, for, for the memories and the uh, uh, history to be kept apart. Mm. So if it continues to be in a place where uh, it's just simply still too much for anyone to hold all of that um, you know, trauma that's happened, it doesn't necessarily, we shouldn't necessarily see that as a bad thing. And therefore, you know, it may well be that people continue on for the rest of their life with, with parts of them, um, you know, still holding different aspects of memory that, that may well continue. Mm -hmm. I think the key thing for, for me is about symptom reduction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whilst uh, we would wish for everyone with DID that, that we have ongoing um, frequent uh, long-term therapeutic support, um, that we also need hope and, and that, you know, the hope that whatever is available in terms of help and support, be that peer support, be that self-help, be that therapy, you know, that we can all learn to, to reduce the symptoms and the key word that Jill was talking about there is fear, um, you know, because the abject fear, you know, whatever that fear represents in terms of historical trauma um, uh, is something that is really really challenging to live with in terms of whether that's night terrors um whether it's even fear of going out of the door because you don't know what's going to trigger you next so um you know and and then you know for some people it, it will result in all of their parts um becoming one uh that tends to be called fusion as opposed because integration is is, is much broader when we're talking about as jill said cooperation communication all of that is integrating um, uh, self states in some way, shape, or form uh, by you know shared information and shared communication. Uh, so, so for us, we're, we're remaining open as it stands at the point in my current healing journey. I can't imagine life without um, the rest of my parts. And for those my parts that are listening, you know, we, we, I'm I'm very grateful to all of us for. Mm. Um, for getting us to this this stage um, but it will vary depending on people's resources and stage of their mm. healing journey I think that's that sort of would wrap that one up Ralph really uh, mm. Alfred, sorry. all right thank mm. you thank you final question um, someone asked how how how, how best to support uh, and respond with some uh, to someone with DID I think the question we had questions that came from people staffing helplines in particular, I wonder what you would say to them. Bill? I, well, yes, I mean, I've, I've written three words, with respect, mm -hmm. with compassion, and with understanding. And, um, and I've written underneath that, um, who have been treated abnormally when young, which rather chimes with the, the, the more frequently thought phrase, which is that, that people with, with DID are not bad or mad, but bad and mad things have been done to them. And it's something about, uh, you know, raising, raising awareness of what DID is all about, raising awareness of that, the fact that, that there have been so, so many far too many little ones who've been treated badly or have been neglected or have been just unfortunate to have gone into hospital at the wrong time all so all sorts of reasons that have caused them traumas and um, but when but when they're very little they've often been sort of silent they've been unheard and they haven't they haven't had any attention for what they've been going through. And the, the problem is that in adulthood, when DID perhaps starts presenting itself, is that these people be, remain unseen and unheard in adulthood again. So it's like a double, it's a double whammy. And then Amanda and I were talking earlier in the week about this whole, this last question. And we were talking about, you know, the, the dreadful, dreadfully damaging media coverage that DID sometimes gets, 
and which brings us, I don't know whether Amanda you want to talk about just a tiny bit about the, um, the monsters inside and the crowded room, for example. Yeah, yeah, and and you know when I think about how would I best like people with DID um, and myself to be supported, you know, you mentioned there about awareness building, and so it, it it's about actually also people being honest about their own fears, or you know, have they got their own um, internal bias, or have they got their own thoughts that go through their mind which would be understandable because those of us that have DID have gone through probably all of the same thought process and be open about that if people are, are, are frightened or they're or they're fearful or they're often that's from a place of not knowing so it's awareness building and, and being open to to learn for themselves and being um, open to be curious uh, but also to support us in our quest to um, help everybody understand and have the level of awareness as perhaps fortunately other um, you know, serious mental health conditions or ways of experiencing our collective multiplicity um, uh, are, you know, just like in any sort of community, it's about being open-minded and, and being curious. And what any sort of community really does not want and often people will rally against and support people is poor and, and harmful media portrayals or, um, or even a lack of support, which in, in its own self breathes stigma. So, uh, you know, if, if people are, you know, often not so much actively silenced, uh, but if they're not seen and not heard, then that's a form of stigma. So yeah, the, the monsters inside at the time of recording this webcast, uh, the whole community is is, is feeling a, a huge sense of um, weight on our shoulders by you know yet another uh, media portrayal. And as far as any of us know, um, you know the docu series uh, has not made any reference to you know the fact that this just one particular portrayal is just a portrayal of one uh, individual. And, and not reached out to the community to, to offer support in any way. So we would ask that others join us in our, in our quest to have a positive um, outward expression of DID and, and, and to, to build their own level of awareness and, and talk to us about their fears because we, we, we've got them too. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so help us with awareness building and uh, so that we can stamp out the stigma. All right. Uh, anything you want to add there, Jill, or shall we? Um, no, just, just one, just one last thing, which came up an awful lot, um, but and it's 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 really not possible for us to address it. Is how can people with DID find help, find information, find support, find a therapist? How can therapists find training? Because of course. The, the whole the whole purpose of me writing uh, the girls within was to raise awareness um, of DID to to make it much more visible and to see one person with DID go through a whole treatment. Um, so basically, what what I'd like to say is that um, rather than create lots of lists. If people want to go to my website, which is um, jillfrost.co.uk, um, they will find all sorts of resources within um, and also all sorts of recommendations and so on. But I'd also like to um, just recommend a, a couple of, of books. One is this one here, which is Coping with Trauma-Related Dissociation. Um, it's a skills training and it's for patients and therapists and also Valerie Sinison's new book which is called The Truth About Trauma and Dissociation, Everything You Didn't Want to Know and Were Afraid to Ask. Um, on my website there are a whole lot of other books um, uh, that I, I reference and of course there are other organisations, particularly organisations in the UK, like first person plural, and there are other organisations which are very important 
um, for people to know about. So yep. if let I me, can leave it there. Let me chip in there because um, I've, I've prepared a little bit uh, um, just to address what, what you're talking about. Your website is a great resource. Um, I noticed from that the Complex Trauma and Dissociation Clinic, which is in Cheshire, and also the Clinic for Dissociative Studies based in London, both accept NHS referrals, both from within their own catchment and, um, and outside it. Now, those are two specialist clinics. I, I don't know what their waiting lists are like. I imagine they might be long, but uh, those two places are worth uh, people look, looking at. Um, and also just something else on Jill's website, if, you're, if you've enjoyed this uh, 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 and want to keep the conversation going, Jill runs uh, uh, Q&A sessions on, on the book, which you can sign up for um, with Jill on, on the website too. And uh, Amanda and the Eternity System can be contacted via Twitter. Is that, do people just put in? Yeah, yeah, just, just look, look us up under a, at a Wonderball. Say that again, at? A Wonderball. Wonderful, lovely. All right, thank you. Uh, just finally, thank you um, to everyone involved, Kate um, in, and uh, uh, Phoenix in, in hosting these events. And uh, thank you to all of you who've been listening and taking the time to hear us. Mm -hmm. And we, we do invite you to join us in, um, in generating awareness and having mm -hmm. conversations about DID and promoting change. So thank you and good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.